Howdy, folks. In uh, July of 2020, I sent some baseball cards uh, to a buddy of mine who pools all of our cards together, and we send in bulk to PSA, uh, Pacific uh, Sports Authenticators out in California, and they grade our baseball cards. They authenticate uh, signatures and, and then what, whatnot, and they put them in a slab. And um, so May 2021, I, I got those cards back. And uh, so it's been 10 months. And uh, so we sent them in, you know, towards the beginning of the uh, pandemic when it first started taking off. And uh, so uh, a lot of people were sitting at home just sending in cards like, you know, what else are we going to do? We are not going to work, right? I mean, I was going to work. But anyhow, um, what happened was PSA got backed up to the point where they were getting uh, 500,000 orders a week compared to that in a three month period. So they basically shut down um, towards the end of March 2021, and they haven't reopened yet for business, except, you know, if you send in a $5,000 baseball card, they're going to grade that. But all the other categories, just the bulk and the, the lower end priced submissions, they just completely suspended right now, which is totally understandable. So uh, usually I'll do, uh, when I get my cards back, I'll do a video uh, when I open them, and uh, we can share the the grade at the same time, and, and you can get my raw reaction, uh, which is fun. But I'm going to do it a little bit different this time. This time, I'm going to turn it into a bit of a history lesson on each of the players that I uh, received back. So I'm going to show you the card. You're going to see the grade. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the player. And, um, yeah, so that's it. So uh, my name is Greg Saltz. I live in Manchester, New Hampshire, formerly of Chula Vista, California, a.k.a. San Diego. So let's get right to it. Alrighty, leading off and playing shortstop for the Cleveland Indians and the Boston Red Sox. Lou Boudreau, 1948 Leaf, beautiful card. Oh, this is such, I love this whole set. Uh, is, I got a PSA too, I'm not that thrilled about the grade, but I'm thrilled about the card and I'm thrilled to have it in my possession. Uh, he's a Hall of Fame baseball player. Uh, the bulk of his career was with the Cleveland Indians. I'm gonna read directly from his Hall, Hall of Fame uh, plaque. Lou Boudreau, Cleveland, led the American League shortstops in fielding percentage, uh, eight seasons, set a major league mark for double plays by a shortstop, 134, and won the batting title in 1944. Uh, paced the American League in doubles three times, the most valuable player in 1948, we'll get into that season for sure, uh, when he batted uh, three, I uh, can barely read that, 353 to lead uh, the Indians to the pennant as a player and a pilot. Hmm, that's what they called managers back then. <laughs> a lifetime batting average of 295. Now, let's read from his bio from the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, website. Lou Boudreau did it all in baseball. He played, managed, and broadcast. He was an excellent defensive shortstop and a gifted hitter. After one game in 1938, and he played 53 games in 1939, he became the Indians' regular shortstop in 1940, hitting 295, driving in 101 runs. Not a bad, uh, really, uh, full freshman season there. Uh, 1942, the Indians uh, shocked the baseball world by hiring their 24-year-old shortstop as a player manager. <laughs> you believe that guy's been in baseball for basically starting for two years? Player manager at 24 years old. That is, I tell you what, man, they must have really respected that guy's intellect. Uh, in 1946, he devised the Williams shift, sometimes known as the Boudreaux shift, placing all of the infielders on the right side of second base and leaving only the left fielder across the diamond in an attempt to stop pull hitting Ted Williams. He invented the shift, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Uh, few players and uh, or managers have ever had a better season than Boudreau did in 1948. That year, Lou Boudreau was the greatest shortstop and uh, and leader I ever saw, said Bill McKinney, uh, a Hall of Famer. The Indians went 97-58, uh, and 58, while Boudreau hit 355 with 106 RBIs and a career-high 18 home runs. With a 453 on on-base percentage and struck out nine times in, in 568 bat. They stole my thunder. I was going to go into that with his statistics. I was shocked when I looked at that. Uh, the Indians and the Red Sox finished the regular season tied, necessitating a one-game playoff at Fenway Park, in which Boudreaux went 4-for-4, four four, home reign twice. The Indians went on to beat the Braves in the World Series. But what it doesn't say here is it, it was the Boston Braves. 
They beat the Boston Red Sox in a one-game playoffs to play the Boston Braves in the World Series. Uh, Boudreau picked up the AL MVP award that year. Uh, then he uh, moved to the Red Sox for the 1951 season and was a player manager in 1952. And then later on, he went on to uh, be a broadcaster for the Chicago Cubs. Okay, so what else do we have here? I just want to look a little bit at that 1948 season of his. Because uh, what I did notice before um, MLB uh, HOF stole my thunder was uh, his walk-to-hit ratio that year. I've never seen anything like it. It's, it's like Tony Quinn, Tony Gwynn-esque. 98 walks and 9 strikeouts. So that's why he uh, his walk-to-hit ratio, his walk-to-strikeout ratio was, was phenomenal that year. His OPS that year was, what was it, 987? Yeah, 987. The all-time leader in OPS was Babe Ruth, 1.16. Ted Williams, 1.15. Lou Gehrig, 1.07. Barry Bonds, 1.05. These are guys that get on base pretty much and they walk a lot. Uh, Jimmy Fox, 1.03. Hank Greenberg, Roger Hornsby, Mike Trout. Those are all the people that are above one. And then you got Manny Ramirez, 0.996. McGuire, 0.98. Mickey Mantle, 0.97. So he's right there in that Manny Ramirez, Mickey Mantle, Mark McGuire, Joe DiMaggio zone. He did that, of course, he did that for one year, but it just tells you what kind of a phenomenal year he had in 1948. And about that 1948 team, the Sporting News uh, magazine ranked that team the ninth best team ever. So I'm, so, I'm, so I'm looking like, who was on that team? Dude, Larry Doby was on that team. I have, Larry, I have an amazing rookie Larry Doby card. I think it's a PSA 4. But... This is what blew me away, and I have this guy's card too. I'll, I'll throw it up here. Uh, in July 7th, 1948, Satchel Paige was signed by the Indians. I think, I forget how old he was. <laughs> is he 48 years old at the time? No, what am I, that, maybe that number is just sticking in my head because of the year. But He was an old timer, and he had lost his fastball, but he still had that knowledge. And, uh, they, and they were in a pennant race. You, they picked up an old-timer from the Negro Leagues in the middle of a pennant race. And uh, the first batter that Page faced was uh, Brown's first baseman, Chuck Stevens. And Page didn't even know the signs. And Stevens uh, lined a single into left field. Uh, Jerry Pretty bunted Stevens over to second. Next up was Willie Platt. And Page threw an overhand server for a strike. Okay, And anybody's ever seen... Pictures of uh, Page, uh, Satchel Page's windup. It's, it's. <clears throat> I would not want to look at an overhand pitch from that guy. An overhand. I don't know what a server is, but uh, you've been served. And then he next pitch he threw a sidearm for another strike. So now he's going. Now he's digging deep into the repertoire. You know. Let's see what kind of quiver I'm gonna pull out of here. And uh, the next pitch he threw what is called his hesitation pitch. His arm goes back and he's. And he's in the middle of pitching, and he's kind of slowing down, pausing, 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 and then boom! Struck the guy. No, the guy, the guy, yeah, he struck him out. And when the guy swung, Platt swung the bat, it flew 40 feet up the line. He was so blown away by this pitch and so confused. So Zach Taylor, the uh, manager of the Browns, bolted from the dugout to talk to umpire Bill McGowan about the pitch. Taylor argued that it was a balk. But McGowan let it stand as a strike. And Page got Al Zarilla to fly out, and the inning was over. In the next inning, Page gave up a leadoff single to Dick Kokos. His catcher simplified the signals, and Page got Roy Partee to hit into a double play. And so that he was out of the inning. And guess who came up to pinch hit for him? Larry Doby, the player who broke the American League's color barrier. Uh, that was, uh, what a heck of a, uh, 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 a day in Cleveland Indians history right there. All right, coming up next, we have a 1909 T206 Jerry Freeman tobacco card. Uh, the Kinney Brothers Tobacco Company, the American Tobacco Company turned into, or another name was the Sweet Corporal Company, and they made, uh, tobacco cards. Uh, baseball cards, you would buy a pack of cigarettes and you would get these cards inside. 
And of course, they're the ones that had the T206 Honus Wagner, one of the most famous baseball cards of all time. But here we have Jerry Freeman, a uh, Punch and Judy uh, rally killer, except for uh, 1907. We'll get into that season in a minute. And this card is when he played for the Toledo Mud Hens, right after he left the uh, Minneapolis Millers. We'll get into that 1907 season when he played for Minneapolis, and he had a great, great year, his only good year, and no doubt they probably sold him and cashed in because they knew he was never going to duplicate that. So the Toledo Mud Hens was a storied franchise with notable uh, alumni like Mo Berg, the, the uh, baseball player who they said could could speak, what was it, seven languages, but couldn't hit in any of them. <laughs> Actually, he was a better ball player than his reputation. He did have a lot of injuries, but he was uh, supposedly in the OSS, the uh, precursor to the CIA, and he was over in uh, Germany um, trying to find out if they were working on any kind of uh, weapons programs. And so I have one of his baseball cards. As a matter of fact, I'll throw one up there for you. Uh, Jim Thorpe went to the school, uh, phenomenal uh, athlete, uh, American Indian, uh, Olympian, uh, multi-sport uh, superstar, one of the greatest athletes in American history. Kirby Puckett went there, Max Scherzer. Anyhow, enough about Toledo. So Jerry Freeman, really, I think this is his only card uh, out there in existence. And you can see that it's a low pop card. There's not too many of them uh, in existence. I'm, I'm proud to have one of them. But Jerry, you know, like I said, classical punch and Judy, singles hitter, um, a career batting average of 278, which is not bad, really. Not bad. Uh, he played with the Portland Browns, Seattle Chinooks, the Seattle Shiwashes. Uh, he's probably sees Indian, uh, uh, Canadian Indian names. The Minneapolis Millers, uh, the Toledo Mud Hens, Albany Senators, uh, the Indianapolis Indians, and the Cleveland Forest City. He began playing in 1903. And he last took the field during the 1912 campaign. So if you look at his career stats, uh, I'll throw his stats up there real quick. Uh, really only uh, uh, 1,065 hits in uh, how many games did he play? 1,072, maybe some of them were pinch hit. You know, basically he got a hit a game. Um, every uh, few games he might get a double or whatever. Uh, uh, but I'm really fascinated with this. I'm looking at his stats and just out of nowhere in 1907, his batting average just skyrockets from 231 to 362 the next year. And I'm like, what the heck? He has the most home runs he ever hit, which was four. Got to remember, this is the dead ball era where center field is 500 plus to 600 feet away. Uh, 10 triples, that's the most triples he ever hit in a season. 25 doubles, the most doubles he ever hit. The most hits he ever had. The highest slugging percentage he ever had. And the highest OPS he ever had, and the most total bases he ever had, all in that one year. And then boom, they dumped him to Toledo. So I, you know, so there was really not a lot interesting about this guy, but I said, let me just look at that one year. And this is how you find out these hidden gems. Look who played, look who batted leadoff on that team. Dude, Buck Freeman batted leadoff. That guy was the Babe Ruth of the day before Babe Ruth. And you gotta remember, in this dead ball era, not only was, you know, you have these polo grounds and you have center field is so far away that people are like, there's nobody's ever gonna hit a home run here. You also had the spitball. It was a dead ball spitball era. And then they had the same baseball. They would use the same baseball for like 100 pitches. So, you know, halfway through the game, you basically have, a softball. <laughs> you, know, you can get hit by the ball and it wouldn't even hurt. So this guy, Buck Freeman, I mean, I know I've shifted from one player to another, but I'm just focused on this year because I just was so fascinated that Buck, that he played, he batted second behind Buck Freeman, who's a member of the Boston Red Sox Hall of Fame. So this guy, Buck, he had 82 home runs with a slugging percentage of 462 with a 346 on base percentage. And in 1899, and he hit 25 home runs. And that record stood for 20 years until Babe Ruth came along and hit 29 home runs. So, so for 20 years, you know, nobody, was, nobody could touch this guy who actually had serious consideration at one time for the Baseball Hall of Fame. And look, look at this season, this 1907 season, when he batted leadoff, Buck Freeman hit 335, followed by Jerry Freeman at 362. And then the next guy was nobody else even hit 300. Uh, and look at look at Buck, eight 
15 home runs. This guy, Buck Freeman, led the league in home runs in, I think, eight different leagues. So the fact that they were both on the same team, just really, like, I never expected to pull that gem, gem out of Jerry Freeman's career. And the only reason I really knew about Buck Freeman is just by doing research. You, you, you just follow these rabbit trails on Wikipedia when you get a baseball card. You just find these interesting things. So there you have it. I'm pretty psyched to have this card in my collection. He, he's not a you know, great player, but he had that one great year. And, and, him, and him and Buck, man, they pulled it off for the, the Millers, 1907. All right, who's up next? All righty. Next up, we have one of the greatest baseball players to ever play the game, Mickey Mantle, number seven. Outfielder for the New York Yankees. This card is a rather unique baseball card in that it's not a Topps or a Bowman or a Fleer or any of those kinds of cards. It's a, it's a serial card. It's a post-serial card. So you'd have on the back of the serial box, uh, some cards on that cardstock, you'd cut it out and then you cut them into individual pieces. This is a PSA 2, which I'm actually kind of thrilled to get a 2 out of it. <clears throat> and um, so I'll give you an example of what like a, a 1962 Topps baseball card would look like. So um, this baseball card 1962, they would show the statistics on the back like most baseball cards. So another unique thing about this card is this, the statistics are in the front. So 1962 is actually one of his uh, MVP years. So that's kind of cool. And what's also cool is in the front of the card, uh, it shows his 1961 statistics. And look at that, 54 home runs, 128 RBIs, 317 batting average. And that is the year that Roger Maris broke uh, Babe Ruth's single season uh, home run record. And for a while there, it was Mantle and Maris, and everybody, of course, wanted Mickey Mantle to get it, and Roger Maris got it. And Roger Maris got the MVP, even though Mickey's uh, statistics were just phenomenal. So he had a great year in 1962, and he ended up getting the um, MVP in 1962. So if you didn't know it, he's just a country boy from this little little hick town in Oklahoma called Spavana, population less than 500 people. If you don't know much about his playing career, you maybe you're in the, the 1%, I'll just give you a brief little bio uh, before I discuss these uh, post-serial baseball cards. Um, so Mantle was one of the greatest offensive threats of any center fielder in the baseball history, of any player in baseball history. He has the uh, second highest OPS among center fielders behind only Mike Trout. Uh, and he has the highest uh, stolen base percentage in history at the time of his retirement. <clears throat> in addition, compared to the other four center fielders of the all-century team, he had the lowest career rate of grounding into double plays, and he had the highest uh, World Series on-base percentage and World Series slugging percentage. So when it was clutch time, Mantle was there. He also hit for uh, average, average in power. And in fact, the term tape measure home run was... Was, uh, was created just to describe his home runs. He hit uh, 536 career home runs. He batted over 300 10 times and is the career leader in walk-off home runs with 13 tied with uh, Jim Tomey. Uh, he's the only player in history to have 150 home runs from both sides of the plate, switch hitter. So the 1962 post-serial baseball cards, there were 200 of them. And... Um, they had the player in the front and the st uh, stats in the front, but the inside was blank. And the first 100 cards uh, that the serial boxes produced were of the American League, and the second 100 cards were of the National League. And, and the two you know, major cards of the AL were the uh, Mantle and that Roger Maris card. So that 1961 season that you're looking at right there, uh, if you if I, if, let me pull up the stats uh, of the top five uh, MVP uh, finalists for that year. So we can just look at some of these statistics for that year. So Mantle had the um, the 54 home runs. Well, you can see his statistics there, 128 ribbies. But Roger Maris, 61 home runs. That number of 60 home runs by Babe Ruth, that, had, that was one of those hallowed, revered baseball numbers that, that, that nobody really wanted to see broken. Uh, 
so Maris, uh, he did it with only 159 hits. Um, and he only batted 269. So he was, Maris was swinging for the fences. And, okay, so some of Mantle's career statistics, if you look at this chart, anything that is bold on this chart, you can see that he led the league in the statistics for that year. So there's a lot of bold just all over this place, either walks, even strikeouts, uh, home runs, uh, triples. He led. He had speed. He, that guy had wheels. Uh, runs. How about hits? He ever lead in hits? Uh, no, he never led the league in hits. But an on base percentage, slugging percentage, OPS, um, total bases, and then you look at the far right column: all star, all star, all star, all star, all star. And then the MVP and the number next to the MVP will say three. So he came in third for MVP. Look at this, third place, 22nd place, 15th, 5th, 1st, 1st, 5th, 17th, 2nd, 2nd, 1st, 2nd, 25th, 19th. So he finished top five a few times there. Uh, <clears throat> phenomenal, phenomenal uh, baseball player. Um, if you, if, and on the bottom of this chart, it shows, like back then I think they played 154 game season. So they showed you what it would look like compared to today's ball players who play a 162 game season, how his career would average if he played a 162 game season. He would average 102 RBIs a year. Um, he would average a 298 batting average and 36 home runs. So that's a, a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, baseball player. Now, I mean, I hate to go into some of his personal life that's 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 not pretty but it's Mickey Mantle and I remember when he got that liver transplant and my mom wasn't happy and I was like come on mom it's Mickey Mantle I mean I don't I didn't see his playing days I remember him on TV commercials growing up real cream a little dab will do you for men to use their head about their hair <laughs> he was the real cream guy you know the hair dye guy <clears throat> and I think DiMaggio was the coffee guy his a lot, a lot of people in his family died young so he wanted, he basically, his theory was, I want to get the most out of life. Uh, and, but what he did say later on is, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. But the rationale for him just being a party animal was that a lot of the men in his family died young. His father died of Hodgkin's disease at 40 years old, and his grandfather died young of the same disease. And so Mickey Mantle says, I'm not going to be cheated, you know. But... At the same time, Mantle didn't realize that those men died because they worked in, in, the, in the mines and they were breathing uh, lead and zinc and that led to those diseases. So he did get a liver transplant. It was, it was damaged uh, cirrhosis of the liver and hepatitis C, and which further necessitated the, the transplant. It kind of bumped him up the list and people thought, oh, it's just because he's, he's a famous per, uh, person. Uh, but he only lived, uh, I think, a couple of months uh, after the transplant. He got the transplant on June 8th. He died, unfortunately, on my 22nd birthday, August 13th, 1995, at Baylor University with his wife by his side. That same day, the Yankees played the Cleveland Indians, and they honored him with a tribute. And, and then at Mantle's funeral, Eddie Layton, which is the longtime piano player for the Yankees, played uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow on the Hammond organ, because Mickey once told him that was his favorite song. And then Roy Clark, y'all know Roy Clark, he sang and he played Yesterday When I Was Young. So yeah, that was sad. Uh, there's a statue of him at the Dodgers AAA ballpark. And, but I, I do want to give a shout out to uh, Greensboro, Georgia, which is where Mantle uh, stayed towards the end of his life. Kind of like a little refuge uh, getaway. Uh, he purchased a condominium Oconee, on Lake Oconee near Greensboro, so, and he stayed there for months at a time. And occasionally he would attend the local Methodist church and sometimes he would have Sunday dinner with members of the congregation. And he was well liked by the citizens of Greensboro and he loved them back in return. And because that, that town respected his privacy. And when, when outsiders would come and ask, hey, where's, uh, where's Mantle's home? They wouldn't even tell the outsiders and they wouldn't even talk about him. You know, he just let his personal life be. And, and Mantle once said that uh, the people of Greensboro had gone out of their way to make home, and make his home, and make him feel welcome there. It's like he found something that he hadn't enjoyed since he was a kid, living in that little uh, hick uh, Oklahoma town. So uh, shout out to Greensboro and um, just 
just thrilled to have this card in my collection. Alrighty, next up we have the sad tale of Tom Alston. Thomas Edison Alston. Named after Thomas Edison. That is awesome. Uh, he was the uh, first African American to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, this particular card is a uh, cookie card. It came from Mother's Cookies. If you bought a, a box of cookies, you would get this card. These cards were issued in 1952 and 1953. It's a West Coast uh, regional card. And they're pretty rare. Uh, you can see that I, um, I think it has a population of 28 cards on the PSA database. So I have one of 28 uh, known in existence that are graded. Uh, so it's a good card to have, you know, and and so 1953 you got a baseball card of an African-American and there's still a whole lot of teams that had not integrated uh, That makes it even a little bit, you know, more special for me So I, I kind of hunt some of these these rare cards out even though they're not worth the big bucks So these mothers could before we get into Tom's life, which is pretty tragic I just want to briefly touch on the mother's cookies. You know, they're 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 different than the the typical baseball cards issued by Topps and Bowman. Those cards had borders, they had sharp corners, and you can see this one. The picture goes all the way to the edge, <clears throat> and it's got rounded corners. So it was six feet five, a native of Greensboro, North Carolina. Imagine that, six feet five in the fifties. That's a giant of a man. So uh, he played for the San Diego Padres, Pacific Coast League, uh, my, my town that I grew up in, San Diego. And um, he was like, he was all right. You know, he had a tough time with certain pitches. You know, it's something he would need to develop. But um, 1954, uh, Gussie Butch, Bush had bought the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. And the guy who owned it before, he just wasn't set that fond about integrating the team. But Bush not necessarily in an altruistic way, uh, wanted to integrate the team because he sold more beer to the African-Americans than any other brewery <laughs> his family owned, Budweiser. <laughs> so um, he told Eddie Stanky, go out and find me a black baseball player. Yeah. Now, but, you know, I mean, I just feel bad for St. Louis that they got this guy and it just didn't really work out. You know. So, yeah, he reported to the team and... Didn't take long before Bush uh, was just disappointed by the athlete. And even when he reported, he learned that he was actually two years older than what the Padres had claimed. So maybe, you know, he misled the Padres. Who knows? So Bush demanded $20,000 back from the Padres. Uh, so uh, he made his Major League debut uh, April 13, 1954. He became the first black player in Cardinals history. He played in 66 games his rookie year. He only batted 246 and four home runs and 34 ribbies. Uh, after that, he only got into, into 25 more games over the course of the next three seasons. So this was clearly a bust. Now let's get into a little bit of his life story here. Um, Tom Alston was born in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1926, one of seven children. He developed a love for baseball from reading stories in the newspapers his mother brought home after she was done cleaning houses as a maid. He joined the Navy in 1944, played baseball on organized teams there. After his return from the military, he attended North Carolina Agriculture and Technical College. During this time, Alston began playing on a traveling team called the Goshen Red Wings. He later joined the Jacksonville Eagles, managed by former Negro Leagues uh, pitcher named Chet Brewer. I don't know if that name sounds familiar. Maybe it's just my imagination. Alston earned his bachelor's degree in 1951 and shortly thereafter went to play in Indian Head, Saskatchewan, with several other Eagles players and the manager. His team won several Canadian tournaments. Tom returned uh, to organized baseball in the United States with the all-black Potterville Comets of the Southwestern International League in 1952. In 19... Uh, and he hit 353 in that league. That's not bad. And uh, soon after was signed by the Padres with a PCL. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, Gussie Bush told Eddie Stanky to go find a black player. He said, you know, hey, listen, you know, I sell a lot of beer to the African-American community. We got to integrate this team now, you know? So uh, we know what happened there. Uh, it didn't work out that well. 
So after platooning the 1954 season, and then all of a sudden he started um, slumping, so they sent him to AAA Rochester. That year, he began hearing voices in his head and was suffering periodic period, periods of debilitating fatigue. Uh, he spent most of the next two seasons in the minor leagues, appearing in only 16 games uh, with the Cardinals, and 13 in 1953 and 3 in 1956. During the 56 season, after hitting 306 with Omaha, Tom started hearing the voices again. And so he actually made a suicide attempt with a razor blade, uh, but a law enforcement officer found him, thank God, and got him medical treatment and then sent him home. So in 1957, he appeared in four games, but his erratic behavior led the Cardinals to send him for more medical attention, mm -hmm. and they diagnosed him with a nervous condition, and he actually received uh, shock treatments from, from the psychiatrists. Uh, after returning to the team in, uh, in September, he went 4 for 13 in the next five games, but rather than stay in St. Louis to continue his treatment, he decided to return home to live with his father, never to play baseball again. That's sad. In uh, 1958, he was actually arrested and charged with assault with a deadly weapon, and he spent 30 days in jail. Later that year, he burned down a Methodist church in, in Goshen, North Carolina. A judge ordered a psychiatric exam, and he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He spent the next eight years in a mental hospital and re was released in 1967, but returned two months later after he set fire to his apartment. He was released again in 1969. In an interview with the uh, Greensboro News and Record, he said that he committed the arson because he felt the community needed a new chapel. In 1991, he told the reporter that he no longer uh, heard voices in his head and he hadn't for about 20 years. For the rest of his life, he took medication and visited mental clinics uh, to control his illness. He lived in poverty and subsisting on Social Security disability benefits because he could not hold down a job due to his erratic behavior. And sometimes he was lucid, sometimes he was not. Uh, he was living in a nursing home in 1990 when visited by Joe Garagiola, and Tom was invited then to uh, throw out the first pitch in a game in June. Joe Garagiola is such a good guy, man. He's such a good guy. He just went and visited this guy in a nursing home, and next thing you know, he pulls him out, and he's throwing out the first pitch for a Cardinals game and, and, and signing autographs. Man, I love that guy. Uh, sadly, Alston passed away from prostate cancer three years later, in uh, 1993, his tombstone is decorated with the Cardinals birds and, uh, and the bat logo. I love this card. That was probably his last happiest time, that 1953. Because everything started to go sour. Once he got called up to the bigs, he couldn't hit. Then he started hearing voices. That time in San Diego was probably the, the last happiest time until, until those voices went away. Anyhow, yeah, I love this card. I love this card. Listen, folks, this is not going to work. I've done four baseball cards, and you guys have already watched for 30 minutes. I, I've, I've been doing this for 10 hours, 8, 10 hours. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm just going to have to just end it here. I'm going to throw this up on YouTube, and then I might just start my own YouTube channel. Just that. It's just going to focus on, on this type of history. So um, well, I'll just do one card at a time. Because it's, it's important to preserve this stuff. I'm digging up stuff that I guarantee you people haven't seen. Even people that have been following baseball for... Even people that are fans of some of these players haven't seen some of the pictures and some of the documentations that I have found. So this is something that could be a little bit of a niche for me. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stop here. I might even split this video up eventually into four separate little videos and then just move forward to try to preserve this national pastime and this how this sport interacts with with the history and with civil rights and with this interesting stories that each of these guys have and the connections that they have with each other. I think it's really, really uh, uh, exciting project. So uh, encourage me if you see me, wish me luck because it takes time and, and, and it takes away from other things that I want to be doing in my life. But I kind of enjoy this. So it's, if, if you find something you enjoy, you might as well go with it. So hope you enjoyed it. And um, wish me luck. Peace.